So appreciate y'all having me here today. It's deck to stem bore on the agenda. Um, that's what I'm starting out with here. Uh, you, you'll find I've got a lot of slides in this presentation. I don't expect to get through all of them. And, and I also, you know, especially when we're in person like this, I like to have a discussion if at all possible. If you've got an insect problem you want to talk about, stop me and let's talk about that. You know, I, I, I'm not shy about changing directions on, on these things to address what you would like to see addressed. Uh, but I do know deck to stem bore has been fairly, I don't know if I'd say serious issue, but it's an issue down this way. Um, and, and it's something that's been generating a lot of interest um, over the last few years. Uh, but if you're all talked out on deck to stem bore, we can talk about something else too, if you prefer that. You can see a pretty good picture of it here. I think most of you, if, you, if you've gone through and split some stems in Southern Illinois, you've probably seen this. You're unlikely to confuse it really for anything else um, if it's in soybean. Uh, if you get into some of the other, you know, some people will find like corn borer larvae um, in some weeds and that kind of thing. They'll confuse it with this. Uh, stem borer does get into giant ragweed in particular. It will get into sunflowers. Um, it'll get into a variety of other species as well. But in soybean, um, pretty distinctive little critter. Uh, what it's doing there, oh, there we go. What, what it's doing, it, it actually bores so that adult, um, which is a longhorn beetle, you can see it up there. She's going to lay her egg in the petiole, um, along the petiole, and that little larva will, will travel up and down that petiole, feeding on the pit. And, and usually, if you have some infest station with the larvae, and especially if you have a lot of it, the, the first thing you're likely to notice is some of those petioles dying. Um, the, they'll start to die. They'll start to flag off of there a little bit, and that can be an indication, an early indication, that you maybe have an issue with this insect. As that larva develops, as it gets larger, as the season goes on, it eventually migrates into the main stem. It'll actually travel up and down that main stem. And I show of hands, how many of y'all have looked at one of these stems before that's been poured into by these? Hard to miss. Um, they'll, they'll move all the way up and down that stem. They'll clean the pit out. That they'll line it with, with frass, which is our, our, our fancy entomology word for poop, uh, is what we're talking about there. Um, pretty distinctive, again, when that happens. Uh, now, what's really interesting um, about this critter it is it's going to overwinter as a larva. Um, you know, different insects, they'll overwinter in different life stages. And with Decta stem borer, it wants to overwinter as a larva. And it does that down in the base of the stem. And, and so when that plant matures, that's its cue that it's time to, to stop feeding and get ready for winter. <clears throat> it'll migrate down to the base of that stem and it'll girdle that stem around from the inside out, uh, create a weak point in that stem. Now, the reason it does that, uh, these larvae are cannibalistic. Uh, a lot of larvae, a lot of insect larvae are cannibalistic. Cornier worms a great example of that. Um, you know, it does that as a, a protective mechanism, basically. It's not so much it really wants to eat other insects, it wants to protect its food source. Um, and, and so, as you might imagine, if, if there's two larvae in there and you were the first one to get down to the base of the stem, that might not be the greatest thing. Someone else might come in and pull you out, beat you up, take your lunch money and leave you out in the cold. So um, they girdle the inside of that stem. They, they kind of want that stem to fall off so that they have a, a safe, protected, overwintering cavity there down at the base of the plant. And, and you can actually see there, hopefully... I can't make that work. That right there up at the, the top of the stem there, uh, they pack that full of this kind of sawdust that they, they scrape off of there. And that's, you, you can go out there and see that, um, fairly distinctive. That's how they protect themselves for the winter hanging out down there. Now that's actually in terms of yield. 
Um, that, that's going to be the biggest risk with this particular insect, is if you get a lot of that kind of damage. If the plants are left out there in the field uh, because it's a wet fall, typically, uh, you can get some lodging from that sort of girdling behavior. Um, so that, that's an issue we run into sometimes. We ran into some of it fall of 2019, um, I think it was, when it was very wet. There were some issues there. Um, and of course, it's lo localized depending on the, the season that you're in. But that's sort of how this insect operates. A couple of things here, that, that overpositional period of the, the female, it's relatively long. Um, they're going to be out and laying their eggs for anywhere between six and eight weeks in, in July and August. Um, that's going to come into play if we, if we talk about trying to manage this chemically. Um, you know, that larva is protected from certainly any contact insecticide when it's inside there, and it's probably protected from most of the systemics as well once it gets into that main stem. Um, so we've had, I would say, mixed luck uh, trying to get chemical control of these adults. There's ways to make it work usually involves multiple applications um, and, and usually involves some different materials perhaps than we're used to spraying. And, and for that reason, it's not something we, we typically recommend, particularly because, you know, managing that lodging it is what we're really most concerned with here. Done some work the last few years uh, looking at getting the distribution of this insect. Um, of course, we're right here, where, where we find a lot of them. It's in Southern and especially it seems like South Central Illinois, but, but it's going to be associated with areas where we have a lot of no-till production. And, and it's kind of an interesting situation here because tillage, of course, it's going to destroy some of those overwintering sites. Um, you think about that when you go through and fill that field up, um, some of those stems down the bottom, they get broken open, that, that larva is gonna die. What, what's interesting, and may, maybe, I don't know, maybe not interesting in a good way, it, it's like if you want to get control on your fields, you're like, ah, I'm going to go till this field, you're probably not going to get that good of control in that one field. You get a lot of migration from field to field with this insect. Um, you get something like there's been a study on it where they got maybe 50, 60 percent reduction in survival in a particular field with tillage. So, you know, if that was an insecticide, we'd call it suppression, right? We'd be like, yeah, that's, that's okay. Um, is, is about the kind of population reduction we'd be looking at. When you combine that across a region, it makes a big deal. And, and so that's why if you go up to Champaign where I'm at and we kill the hell out of everything, we don't see a lot of deck to stem borers. They can survive up there just fine. They survive in Nebraska. You, you, you know, latitude-wise, it's not a challenge for them. Um, but when you're tilling everywhere like that, we don't see a lot of issues with that to stem for. When we've got a lot of no-till, a lot of conservation till, that's where we find it. But that's also, I want to point out, I'm not recommending like, ah, you go out and fill the field and you'll get rid of them. That's what you should do. No, you, you shouldn't. What, what you should do is, it is sort of learned to live with, with this little critter, at least from an insect standpoint. Because in terms of, you know, the yield reduction, again, what we're really worried about here it is preventing that lodging. Um, but you can see here we got in 2021, and this, this work was funded by ISA. I realized after I put this slide together that I didn't put that in the, you know, in the PowerPoint for the talk I'm giving with ISA. So apologies for that, ladies. But, um, that, that's what I did. <laughs> but we had upwards of 64% uh, uh, was the highest uh, rate of infestation in the fields that we visited um, in 2021. Th this last year, we had one that was up as high as, I think it was 85%, 90%, something like that over by Wren Lake. Um, one thing we tried to do this second year is, is visit some areas that we didn't get as well in, in year one. So we got over in Southwest Illinois, you see a good cluster of fields there. Um, didn't see a ton of infestation in that part of the world. Uh, we went up to Monmouth, uh, another area where we have some no-till production and we didn't find them um, up there 
just based on our observations, based on what we're hearing, primarily a Southern Illinois issue um, when we look at this particular insect. And, and that carries over into the adults as well. These are data from uh, Kelly Estes's statewide survey. So in this case, we're not splitting the stems the way um, that we were in the survey that I showed you before. We're, we're going out, Kelly is and her students, uh, sampling soybeans with the sweep net trying to find the adults. And we find them down here um, and, and not so much throughout the rest of the state. Um, and, and again, makes sense when we look at the, the tillage patterns that we see in Illinois, uh, corresponds well with the observations we've gotten um, from folks in this area over the last few years. What, what's interesting here, and we, we've had more and more talk of this insect in Illinois um, over the years, certainly since I've gotten here, but my impression is before I was here, this is something that people have been gradually noticing more and more. Uh, probably something that's moving into the area for whatever reason. What's really interesting about this insect, if you go back into the, the history of it, so they believe that it at some point jumped hosts from uh, ragweed and sunflower, some of the, the Asteraceae uh, plant family there over into soybean. Uh, if you look at the taxonomy of the plants that this insect feeds on, soybean is kind of weird. Um, they don't really feed on a lot of legumes. Um, so an interesting scenario there. We don't know why it would have jumped hosts. Uh, one thing I'll point out is kind of segue here, an insect they're dealing with out in the Western Midwest, um, Eastern Nebraska, Western Iowa, the soybean gall midge. We, we also did a, soy, a survey for that this year. We didn't find that in Illinois. Haven't found that in Illinois. I don't expect we will um, anytime soon based on its movement patterns. But that's another insect that they think actually jumped hosts from something else into soybean sort of inexplicably uh, 10 years or so ago, at least 10 years or so ago is when they started noticing that. Really interesting scenario with that insect as well. I'm not gonna talk about it in detail because we don't have it here. Uh, God willing, we will continue to have it here and I'll continue to not have to worry about it too much. Uh, some examples of what I was talking about with the, the dying of those petioles. Again, that can be a good early indication that you have this insect. So you start to see that um, probably in mid-July um, is when you might start to see that. One thing you'll note, these larvae, um, they, they put size on as the season goes through. So if you go out looking for them in July, uh, you might not find them. And it's likely because those larvae are simply too small to, to easily find. You've got to be pretty careful uh, to dig one of those larvae out of one of these petioles that they're boring in and out of. Um, and then by sort of the end of August on into September, you get into these third instar larvae like you see in that, that soybean plant on your right. Uh, and, and that's where it's pretty easy to find, pretty difficult really to confuse with anything else. One thing in particular, if you look at that larva closely, you won't find any legs. Uh, the, the family of insect that this is in is the serumbicity, but it's a longhorn beetle is what that's called. Most of these feed on trees and most of these feed on dying trees. And, and so if you gather gathered firewood and you break the bark off the top of it, you'll, you'll see a number of different beetles that live in there and beetles in this family are one of the more common ones that you see. They don't have legs. They, they have these sort of ridges around their body and they kind of slither like a snake is how they get through there. Uh, they'll also, they can move forwards or backwards, which as you might imagine, if you're boring inside of a tunnel that's the size that you are, being able to back up is a pretty useful uh, ability to have, right? So they, you'll, you'll see them, they actually uh, travel both directions. Uh, Kind of an interesting thing there. We also see a good bit of parasitism um, with this insect. So there's um, some species of wasps and some species of tinnid flies that will parasitize these. And where we find a lot of this parasitism typically is in the fields with the highest levels of 
infestation. Um, haven't really looked at, at the ecology related to this as far as if you can see a population crash uh, from this parasitism the way you will with several other insect species. But occasionally you'll, you'll pop a stem open and instead of finding one deck of stem borer larva, you find sort of the husk of that larva and several other, in this case, we're looking at fly larvae, I believe, um, that are feeding on that insect. Uh, my colleague, uh, Raul, over in Kentucky, Western Kentucky, he's looked at this a little bit, um, so I'm hoping he'll uh, come out with some information on especially what the impact of this is on the population. Uh, but we had an arm farm trial over in Carmine a few years ago where we found very high numbers of larvae at first um, and very high levels of tunneling. Uh, but when we looked at the end of the season, counting the actual live larvae, uh, found a lot of these guys instead. So again, kind of a curiosity, um, something that we, we don't use in management at the moment, but could have an effect on these populations. In terms of other signs of what we're looking for here, so when they do that girdling at the end of the season, very often you'll, you'll find this pile of sawdust on the outside of that plant. So where they've actually cut through that dried plant from the inside out and they'll leave that pile of sawdust at the base. That can be an indication before you actually go through and split that stem open, which at harvest is hard. You know, we've done a lot of it. It's kind of a pain in the butt, uh, but you can see an early indication of this uh, with these piles of sawdust at the end. And, and one thing to note, if you're seeing a lot of that, that's a pretty good indication, you know, not just of the type of infestation that you have, um, but that they're dirt, that they're active in doing what they do uh, to, to impact yield. And, and so that's an indication when you see it, you, you know, I, ideally you, you could get those beans out of the field relatively quickly. Um, and, and you see again, what, what's causing that they go up. And I don't know if you can see this very well, almost a, a C-shaped um, little cut on the inside of there. It's a very clean cut. Um, and, and you'll actually see in, in some cases, uh, like you do here, kind of a row of these uh, where the, the plants have fallen over and, and you have that girdled base of the stem from that. Uh, you can see one, one image from um, the top there on what that kind of looks like. So again, when we, when we talk about management, um, what we're really focused on, what we're really concerned with from a management standpoint is that lodging. Um, that, that's the priority is to try to prevent that. A timely harvest is the best way to do it. Obviously, when we get into the worst situations with this insect, it's because crop matured, it got wet, we couldn't get into the field. Um, there's not a lot we can do about that. Um, when that happens to us. Uh, one of the things you can do, you know, if you find that you've got a field that's infested, like what, what do I do with that information? Um, take those fields with the highest levels of infestation and just try to get them out of the field first, if you can. Um, I don't have to tell anybody in here like, oh yeah, you want to get harvested in a timely manner. Yeah, no, no kidding, right? Everybody wants to get the heck out of there in, in October. Um, but you can use this pest information, infestation information to help prioritize things. Um, I like to tell people to remove giant ragweed, not because we've demonstrated that that has a big effect on the population, but because I hate giant ragweed. And I'd like to never see it again um, at anywhere. You, you know, up in, in Northern Illinois, Northern Point Root Farms really love to feed on giant ragweed. So I tell them to get rid of, you know, get rid of your giant ragweed. Yeah, terrible plants, the worst plant maybe. Um, so it, are the symptoms the same in giant ragweed and sunflower? Does the, does the insect girdle the stem and, and leave the sawdust around giant ragweed? It, it does to some extent. We don't, we don't really look at it the same way because, you, you know, we, we don't manage sunflowers in a serious way here in Illinois, or at least I, I never have. Most people don't. And with giant ragweed, obviously... Yeah, we, we don't really follow it the same way. One thing you'll see in sunflowers that's kind of interesting is you will see multiple tunnels more often. And it makes sense because it's a 
it's a fatter stem, right? There's more room in there. There's more pit for them to be feeding on. Um, but yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, we don't follow it the same way. Raul was doing some work looking at like sunflowers next to soybean and if they had any kind of preferential movement to that. Um, my early indication from what he saw was that it kind of, yeah, they move into there, but then they sort of spill over into soybeans. So I, I don't think it functioned very well as reduction. Um, it's a really interesting scenario, especially when you've got these, these very different plants, you know, in terms of their biology, in terms of their architecture, everything about it, and, and they're feeding on the stems in these different plants. Uh, yeah, really kind of fascinating. Um, and yeah, we haven't looked at it much because we don't do a lot of it. Unless you're growing like a bird plot or something, you probably don't have a lot of sunflowers, um, maybe in a garden, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so chemical control, uh, it's not nothing. Um, what you can do, you can kill the adults and that will prevent them from pouring into the stems. Timing is critical if you want to do that. If you're too late, there's very little you're going to do to get those larvae after they're inside of the plant. Um, there's a few folks who have indicated to me they've had some success with that using like a systemic type material, um, either like a diamide or a minocloprid. When we use diamides down in Arkansas, it, it was another suppression sort of situation. We would get maybe 20%, 30% control of these larvae. Uh, that diamide at that time cost 20 bucks an acre to spray, something like that, more akin to a fungicide than most of us are using bad for an insecticide. Uh, the, the point of that is, is we haven't found a real consistent way to make chemical control pay because the bulk of the yield loss that we're seeing is related to that lodging. It, it's not necessarily related to the tunneling within that main stem. We think typically that's occurring late enough that we don't have a big impact on seed fill from that. But there's been some indications in some situations where you can get some yield loss from that, but it's extremely variable. Um, in, in some cases, so out of Kansas State, they did experiments where they put, it's fipronil, it is the insecticide, it's one you put on your dog or your cat to keep fleas away. Um, there's some agricultural formulations too, we don't have them available to us in soybean, but that will apparently get that decastemboer population to zero. Um, when they did that, they compared zero stem borer to pretty healthy infestation. Uh, typically, they did not see a yield impact from that. There were some cases they did, like one or two site years where they did see some yield, but most of the time they saw nothing. Um, so interesting scenario there. Something actually I'm kind of interested in trying to duplicate here, um, but of course, you know, you, you've got to do something that's not perfectly legal, so you've got to destroy the grain and all that kind of we, we haven't done it yet, but we'll try at some point. We'll probably try it there at UN, so maybe one of these years I'll be talking to you all about it there at the UN field day. Um, but in general, what, what we're looking at in terms of management is, is managing lodging, um, is trying to avoid that lodging, trying to get out of the field as soon as we can. And again, obviously want to hire, harvest the field on time, prioritizing those fields that have high levels of infestation with this insect. Um, for an early harvest. Any questions or observations on stem board? Anything you'd like to talk about that way? Yes, sir. Does, does population of soybean stem size have any effect? I mean, it seems like it's not as prevalent in thicker beans as it is in road beans at the time of the thinner. That, that's a great question. It's a question we had. Um, we did a plant and date study. Actually, we did one down by uh, uh, Carmine um, on Jack Sailor. Uh, we did one over with uh, Leon McLaren um, there at, yeah, Thompsonville. There you go. That, that's the town we were in. Yeah, good, good little restaurant there. We had. <laughs> and I remember one day. <laughs> um, 
So we did a, a CD rate study, right? And we looked at, we measured everything. We measured stem diameter, we measured plant population, all of that. We didn't find an effect. We found a slight effect of seeding rate on the rate of infestation in one of the site years. We had, we had four site years there, very slight. What was really interesting is we looked at stem diameter because with that, that's what we were really thought was going to carry the day, right? And when we put that line up there, like the regression on stem diameter and infestation, it, it was like not just no relationship, but aggressively no relationship, like no, no trend whatsoever. It was one of those giant clouds where, you know, if, if you've worked with R squared values, the R squared is like 0. 0.00 to like where it's basically, you know, it, it could have been in the shape of middle finger pointed at me. <laughs> like it, it was just like, oh, okay. So yeah, got it. Um, you know, one thing we've noted in, in some cases is, is you can see some differences in, in lodging depending on the row space and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't found a trend with, with stem diameter to this point. So a lot of times, that is, I'll get a phone call about somebody thinks they've got deck is some strong like sudden death it's after the fact it's too late yeah but when you get there oftentimes it's a lot thinner stand and they notice it laid down versus if it's a thicker stand they just think it's large so i just wondered if that yeah and that that's a good point too i know the the first uh stem borer call i ever got it, we didn't well it, it was a stem borer call it was down in arkansas and it was actually a nematode issue but they'd start going through and splitting those stems, you know, stem bore, stem bore, stem bore, stem bore. And so then we had to go out and kind of delineate that and go, well, actually over here, you, you've also got stem bore, stem bore, stem bore, stem bore. Um, so that's a good point. It's one of those things that kind of, because it's so conspicuous, right? Like you split that stem open, you're, oh my gosh, like <laughs> this is what's doing it, right? It, it's gotten sort of associated with, with several other issues in some cases. Maybe with the weak stalks, it could make our sickle section last longer. So it might be an economic positive. That might be something to think about too. There you go. I'll, I'll sell it that way. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You already answered my question. My question was: Is there any correlation with life? Oh, okay, sure, sure. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. Any other uh, questions? Can you repeat the question for those online? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and the, the, the question we were talking about um, is if, if there was a relationship with, with stem diameter um, and, and some, some of the other agronomic factors like that that can influence stem diameter. Um, is there an impact of uh, planting either earlier or using the earlier maturity uh, variety for the adaptive region? That, that's a good question, too. And the, the question is about if, if there's an impact of planting date and maturity level on stem borer. And, and there, there certainly is. We, we don't have a good handle on it here as far as what really the most susceptible planting dates are. Seems to be more common in full season um, type beans. Uh, down in Arkansas, we would say this first week of May were, were the ones that tended to get the highest rates of infestation. Uh, one thing that we do know here, um, probably part of what is happening is when you're planted a little bit earlier, they, they simply have more time to develop um, and to move up and down that stem and put some body mass on and become more noticeable, uh, you know, to have that tunnel and be more visible. What happens is when that plant dries down, that that's their that's kind of their their stop zone, right? So if it, if it's a later planted bean, they got in there later, um, and you, you know you can have a variety actually of different stages of larvae in these different plants, even in an early plant. You can have them coming in early, coming in late, but the earlier that larva gets in there, the more size it's going to put on, and, and the more likely it is to really bore out the inside of that that main stem, like. Uh -huh. How far away will the adult fly? That that's a good question. So they're not super strong flyers. Um, I think they did a flight mill study on these, and, and the range was it, it was something like a couple of miles that they could fly. 
Uh, most of them very likely aren't going that far. And, and so most of that movement is relatively local, like within a few fields. Um, you know, they do move from field to field, uh, but we don't think they're going, for instance, from, from here, like, like occasionally with corn rootworm, you'll get these big mass migration events where they wash up on the shore like Michigan and that kind of thing. They don't seem to exhibit that kind of behavior where they're really taken off from the field and, and going miles and miles and miles. Anything else on the on stem board? I got it. Looks like I got about 20 minutes left. Is that right? Okay, sure. That sounds good. Sounds good to me. Um, so the next one I've got on the docket here is stink bugs. Um, I don't have much in the way of slides on this, but I thought this would be something to be be worth some discussion with you all if you would like to. My my indication is this in in southern Illinois is probably your most serious insect pest um, in terms of actual yield impacts in soybean. Of course, it's sporadic like it is everywhere. Um, it's not going to be in every field every year by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but stink bug injury in general it is something that we've seen more of in Illinois over the last five, ten years than we had historically. Um, variety of potential reasons for that. Um, one, we do have a, a new speed, well, relatively new species, an invasive species of stink bug, the, the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, we have that in Illinois now. What the pattern with that insect has been to our east, where it kind of started building up in the U.S., and, and this isn't a, a picture of that, by the way, it's, it's a green stink bug. It's neither brown nor marmorated, but um, in the east, as they pick these things up, First, you start to see problems in houses. Um, it is the first place it gets noted is you get overwintering in homes. Um, starts to become a pest. Actually, about this time of year, usually when it's a warm day, they'll they'll wake up and start flying around in your house. Um, then you get issues in specialty crops, and we're in that situation in Illinois right now, where it's it's starting to become a, a fairly major problem on some of our fruits and vegetables, um, that kind of thing. And then you get into row crops. Now, like the good news for soybean, this brown marmorated stink bug, it's just another stink bug in soybean. Causes the same sort of damage as green and brown stink bugs do. do. Uh, in, in the specialty crop world, it hops from fruiting structure to fruiting structure to fruiting structure. And like, you know, every apple it feeds on, it ruins, right? Every peach it feeds on, it ruins. It's not quite the same thing in soybean, more akin to the other stink bug pests that we already have in soybean. The one big difference um, that, that we have to think about in, in soybean and even potentially in corn with brown marmorated stink bug it is its behavior. It, it's very effective at dropping out of the canopy if it sees your shadow, for instance, or if you walk by it. It's a little flightier than these other stink bug species. The consequence of that is it's more difficult to monitor. Um, you've got to be a little more careful when you're monitoring this thing. Our colleagues out east have noted if you're using a sweep net to monitor, a lot of times they're dropping out of the canopy in front of that. And if you're not very careful with that, that net, uh, know what you're doing with that net, uh, you're going to miss a lot of it. If you're not very careful with your visual observations with that species, they're out there dropping. And that's in addition to the normal, you, you know, stink bugs have this behavior where they sort of like crawl around the side of the stem and hide from you. They're they're fairly sneaky, like they're they're fairly good at hiding. You, you do have to be aware when, when you're monitoring for this species that they're a little more difficult to find. For us in Illinois, right now in soybean, down here. Green stink bugs, for the most part, are the, the bigger issue in soybean. Uh, in some cases, you can get into some more browns. Uh, the brown species are a little bit harder to kill for whatever reason. Um, they're a little bit more difficult to control with insecticide. Uh, most of what we're dealing with, at least the last couple of years, has been green stink bug. It's been my experience. I don't know if anybody's seen every, anything different. Had some fields where they really struggled with 
with brown stink bug and brown marmorhead. I've seen a mix. Mm -hmm. What what is it with the with their life cycle that would cause them to have another flush of little ones in, in the late summer? Because I noticed two years ago in doing a lot of a lot of scouting at a certain farm that there was everything was clean. Mm -hmm. And it got to the point, put fungicides on, and you know it was pretty well done. Came came back at that harvest, and the field was just full of little bitty ones. And that's been the case where I've seen the biggest damage is when you have that mm -hmm. late hatch, and you'll you'll see notice a lot more smaller ones because you always see some big ones, no, no matter what. Yes. But it's been with the with the extra ones, with the, those little bitty ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, there's a couple of things there. One, in terms of what happens with the life cycle, it, it's all about how long their season is. So there, you, you know, some insects like like corn rootworm is very fixed in, in terms of when its life stages are going to happen. Stink bugs aren't that way. So it's about how early in the season they get started and, and what they're doing throughout the season. No, none of these species just feed on corn or just feed on beans. They're, they're going to a variety of different plants and they're feeding on seeds and fruits primarily. They'll feed on a growing point if that's all they've got, but primarily they're moving from plant to plant to whatever has seeds and fruits on it. And so when you see all those smaller stink bugs late in the season, typically that means they either got an early start in the spring and were able to go through two generations, maybe a partial third at the end of the season, or it means it got hot in the middle of the summer and sped up their development. Uh, so very temperature dependent with stink bugs um, and not really tied to, like, like they don't have that, that really strict diapause start date the way like a, like a corn worm would. They're, the more heat you have, the more generations they're going to go through. And, and that is something, that's, that's why the further south you go in the US, the more stink bugs sort of dominate as the pest because they can go through more generations uh, and you get more flushes of those immatures. The, the other thing about the immatures when they're in there, one thing to keep in mind with them, they can't go anywhere. Uh, so where an adult, you know, they might feed on soybeans for a little while, lay eggs, and then go off to like a pecan tree or something like that. They, they might go to a variety of different places. The nymphs are stuck there. And, and so when you get that high population of nymphs in that field, they're just going to keep feeding and feeding and feeding on that soybean. Um, they also, like a lot of insects, tend to feed more as an immature put on biomass. And as an adult, they're, they're spending more of their energy on dispersing, on reproducing, mating, laying eggs, that kind of thing. Uh, where the nymphs, all they have to do all day is feed like that's what they do, just gather resources. And, and so a lot of times the feeding intensity, even on a smaller immature, is going to be a lot higher than it is with an adult. With our thresholds and that, you know, we got a threshold if you're using a, a sweep net, nine and 25 sweeps. If you're sampling uh, around one per row foot, one thing to keep in mind with that measure, that's if you're using a shake sheet, that's if you're really getting all of them, if you're just going through visually, you're probably not gonna find every one of those in one foot, in, in a row foot. So keep that in mind in your sampling. Um, we count the adults and the immatures the same in that, but you're right in that when you have those immatures established in that field, that's usually a more serious situation than when you're just finding a few adults here and there. Um, now I forget what I actually talked about on the slide. <laughs> no worries. Uh, one thing I did want to point out, I always like to make a point with this, and I think in, in Southern Illinois, you're probably very aware of this. You, you're going to start seeing the stink bugs in the field, really at R5 it is when they tend to start to build up. They're interested in seeds in particular, and so they're going to feed directly on the seed. They've got a piercing sucking mouth part, so they spit saliva into that seed, they liquefy it, and they slurp it back up. Um, one of the consequences of that, you know, the, the most common 
pest control tactic in Illinois right now probably is dumping a dollar twenty-five silencer in the tank when you're making a fungicide pass, right? That's that's probably the most common practice that we have. That's not controlling stink levels. Um, that material is going to be out there five to ten days, and it's done. Um, the stink bugs very likely aren't in the field at that time. And, and we could, you know, debate what material you're using and that kind of thing. But the reason we really push with stink bugs a threshold based approach going out, finding that insect and targeting it. Part of the reason for that is preemptive control, like getting an insecticide out there and hoping they're going to encounter it. Uh, typically, we're going to have pretty bad luck with that approach. Especially if it's a generic pyrethroid, um, it, it's just not going to be out there all that long. Um, but this damage is going to occur fairly close to the end of the season. Any questions or comments on that piece of it? Seen any bean leaf beetle pod scarring down this way? We've seen a lot of it in Champaign Town over the last few years, a lot of it. Uh, and to the north of there. Um, this last year wasn't so bad. Two years ago, it was pretty bad. Three years ago, it was really, really bad. Um, a lot of this kind of damage. Wanted to talk through this just a little bit. Uh, one of the really important things to note here, big difference between bean leaf beetle pod scarring and like stink bug feeding. With a stink bug, you're feeding directly on that seed. You're directly injuring that seed. With bean leaf beetle, you're feeding on the outside of that pod. Um, now, if you pop that pod open right now at that stage in its development, um, that seed would be fine, right? There wouldn't be anything wrong with that seed at that point. What will happen here with this kind of injury is as that pod dries down, you'll start to open up some cracks in that pod as it matures. If you have enough of that, you'll get moisture into the pod. You'll get pathogens into the pod. You, you'll get a reduction in yield and especially in quality from that. Now, the reason it's important to make that distinction, a much smaller number of stink bugs are, are going to cause economic damage than with bean leaf beetles. It takes a lot more bean leaf beetles and a lot more of this pod injury um, before it starts to show up in yield. And the reason for that is not every one of those scars is going to lead to an injured seed. And, and that's the reason our thresholds for these are, are really quite a bit higher. If you look at the actual number of bean leaf beetles it takes to cause that like 10% or so pod scarring um, where we really think we need to do something about it, it's going to be pretty filthy with bean leaf beetles. Like there's going to be a lot of them um, there on into early R6. Uh, to be seeing this kind of damage. Um, other thing to note, it's just bean leaf beetle. Um, I'm not going to get into identification too terribly much here, but like corn rootworm beetles don't do this. Japanese beetles don't do this. Uh, corn earworm uh, do some pod damage. We typically don't see high enough populations of corn earworm uh, to see much in the way of pod feeding, um, but it does happen from time to time. Not so often in Illinois though. But uh, yeah, when, when you find Japanese beetles out there, they're, they're not feeding on pods in the same way that bean leaf beetles are. Um, and of course, the, the, the reason I say that is because we, we get that question and we get those applications as well. Um, when you look at chemical control of bean leaf beetles, another thing to note here, because bean leaf beetles build up to much higher populations, before they're really at an economic threshold. We find that it's a lot easier for us to get good insecticide data on them. When we've got enough stink bugs to get a really good insecticide evaluation where we can get really good separation between the treatments, that's a, a pretty nasty stink bug field. With bean leaf beetles, we can go into a field like this one where we had so close to 40 per 20 sweeps, um, so close to two per sweep there. A lot of bean leaf beetles. Um, we get good control. Uh, we find that controlling bean leaf beetles here in Illinois isn't all that much of a challenge. 
Um, again, if you find that application at the right time. Uh, in this case, though, with that high population of beanleaf beetles, we did not get separation in yields. Um, we, we didn't get a reduction in yield from that level of feeding. The year before that, uh, again, not hard to clean that, that beetle population out. And this is one point. Both of these are at three days after treatment, three days after our application. That control held out to 14, 15 days because that insect was done coming into the field with them. Um, so if they're no longer migrating into the field, of course, residual control isn't as important. Also, these went out late R5. Uh, this is a similar population. So we've got 10 and 10 sweeps getting up close to 20 in some of our plots there. Uh, we didn't actually see a difference in pod scarring from that when we looked at the pod scarring. Again, takes a lot of these insects, a lot of this kind of feeding um, before we're seeing economic levels of damage. And, and that's really the, the big takeaway on this when we talk about bean leaf beetle. Um, I, I don't want you to see one of those scarred pods and think, well, that's a ruined pod, you know, that's a ruined seed. It, it's some lower percentage of those scarred pods that are actually going to ultimately open up that crack in the pod get that moisture in with the seed and cause damage directly to that seed. That's why our threshold's that high, right? That's why it's 10% of pods scarred um, is because most of those scarred pods aren't going to amount to anything. And mind the, the CHI there. Final thing I'm gonna point out here, and some of you have seen this slide already, we recalculated our economic thresholds for defoliating insects. This isn't taken into account pod feeding, mind you, this is for defoliators. We recalculated them based on updated prices, uh, 30 up to R2, 10 at R3 to R5, 15 at R6. Um, what I wanna point out to you here, that's based on some averages. When we plug in some higher amounts, um, so like the actual averages from 2021, Lowers it a little bit, um, doesn't lower it all that much. I really like this scenario. Um, I don't know how many of you are averaging 100 bushels per acre across your farm. I, I'm not either. I'm not either. Um, so, but why I like this scenario, you got 100 bushel soybeans, you're up at 1750 a bushel. We've been there um, at times. Uh, that's actually double the value of that high average scenario, more of a typical scenario for ill war. Uh, we didn't have that economic threshold when we did that. The reason for that, when you look at this defoliation yield loss relationship, it's not a straight line. We don't start to see yield loss until we build up that defoliation to kind of critical level. And that's the reason why for years and years and years, we hadn't updated our thresholds based on economics, because it actually takes a lot of defoliation before we see any yield loss. But, you know, $15, $16, $17 soybean, well, yeah, we better go ahead and recalculate this. Um, does lower them, does not lower them to the point where we should be spraying defoliating insects all that often. Um, we actually went out, we sampled, 65 soybean fields throughout the north central U.S. Uh, we found one of them that exceeded the new threshold. That was field that we had some defoliation in. So it happens. It just doesn't happen all that often with defoliating insects, um, even with the updated prices. Want to bring up some of these resources, my contact information. Um, like, like Terry mentioned, I'm happy to. Happy to uh, email my slide set out to you if you'd like it, um, if you'd like any of the information I've got here. Uh, those books that are at your uh, tables there, uh, all the insecticide efficacy data, all the root worm evaluations, the bean leaf evaluations we've done over the last year are in that one. There's a link in there. It takes you to the same place as the link up top, and, and that'll get you to the, all the reports we've done since 2018. Um, with that, I think I'm done. Um, have to take any questions if we still got them. Yes, sir. I think I know the your answer to this, but you would advise against the 
prophylactic spraying of an insecticide like an R2 with 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 your fungicide application? I, I would. And the, the thing we see at R2, um, there, there's a couple of things here. Most of what we're killing with that application is Japanese beetles. For, for Japanese beetles on their own to cause economic levels of defoliation, I'm not going to say it never happens, just that I've never really seen it. Usually, if we get up to those levels, it's Japanese beetles came in, and then green clover worm came in, and then finally, at the end of the year, bean leaf beetle comes in and sort of finishes the job. When we go looking for insect pests at R3, we don't find very many of them. So in my mind, what I would prefer you do is to, to wait until you get something at a threshold, if you have it, and, and use that shot when it's at a better timing. Now, I also understand they're, they're super cheap. Like, I, I know why they go out. I get that piece of it. But in terms of insect management at R3, we're, we're not doing ourselves a lot of good with that shot. Any other questions? One thing I, I will point out, I, I'd like to get some on-farm data on that. One thing we find every once in a while, someone will see a response to that R3 insecticide. They rarely count the insects that go along with that. I, I'd like to get some of those trials out there and actually count the insect and see what's happening. Like if and when we get that response, why was it? What insect test was doing? Yes, sir. So I'm 100 miles north of here. And uh, I'm going to say four or five years ago, we had Japanese beetles really, really bad. Sure. And in the last two, three years, we really haven't. We, we got them, but mm -hmm. not bad enough to do any damage. But we hear guys farther north really complaining about them getting a lot bigger. Why are they moving? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know exactly why. They seem to go on these almost waves, like, like across, and they'll, they'll sort of shoot across, and then they'll die down where they were before. Whether that's natural enemies that are building up and killing them in the soil, um, diseases, that kind of thing. I don't really know. I don't have a good answer for it, but we've seen it, too. Um, you know, a few years ago, actually, my first year here, we had a filthy population of them in Monmouth. Uh, ever since then, been very quiet. The other thing we see is we see a lot of variability, even kind of when they've gone through one of these sort of waves, come through an area. We'll see a lot of variability. So like my, my brother-in-law down in Effingham calls me up this last year. He's got loads and loads and loads of them in this field. Where I am in Champaign, there's none of them. Like fewer Japanese beetles than I've ever seen, I won't say ever seen, ever seen in the Midwest. Uh, soil moisture probably has a lot to do with that, you know, getting in kind of that sweet spot, not too much, not too little. That's how most insects that complete their development in the soil, they, if they have too little moisture, they die. If they get flooded out, they die too. So having it in that right area uh, really favors those populations. Too. Any other, I think I'm going to. Get, get off to let the next speech I'm not go. Really out. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, yeah. Appreciate your, your time and I'll, I'll be around through lunch. Yeah. Yeah.